listening to theoutdoorstation.co.uk. The John Muir Trail is one of the world's most spectacular treks and is North America's best known mid distance walking trail, running for 216 miles through the high Sierra Nevada mountains of California right through to the summit of Mount Whitney, the highest peak in the USA outside Alaska. To walk the John Muir Trail successfully, thorough planning is required, and thankfully, Alan Castle has written an extensive guide for Cicero, which contains all you need to know. Everything from how to plan and prepare for your trip, obtaining trekking permits, to buying trek food and forwarding food parcels along the trail, as well as the practicalities of dealing with inquisitive bears, coping with altitude, negotiating river crossings, as well as tips on booking transport to and from the trailheads and what equipment to take. Ronald Turnbull used this guide to prepare for his recent trip along the John Muir Trail, and I thought it would be interesting to hear about his experience and how it might add to the information already available in Alan's book. Yeah, it was an excellent trip. It was more enjoyable than I thought it was going to be, actually, because I was really worried about this being such a huge, tough trail that I'd heard about, and the fact that you had to carry at least seven days of food at once for the final stretch of it, no resupply, just straight through the wilderness. I've never in my life carried more than three days of food, and I wasn't sure I was even going to be able to move underneath this rucksack when I loaded it up at the Muir Trail Ranch on day 11 or whatever it was. And, yeah, there was a... We got to Muir Trail Ranch. We'd made friends with a chap who we who was from, um, yeah, Georgia, Jim from Georgia, who had a rather different ethos to us. He was going slower than we were. And we arrived just as he was putting on his rucksack. He just spent three hours unpacking the package that had been sent in for him on the mule. And he put it into his rucksack and thrown away what he couldn't get into his rucksack. And just after we got there, he was putting his rucksack on. And he started putting his rucksack on and he went into sort of crouching position and got underneath his rucksack and then he got one of his arms in and then he got the other arm in and then he sort of managed to get hold of his poles and about five minutes after he'd started putting his rucksack on he'd finished putting his rucksack on and then he went off in a sort of semi-crouching position at about one mile an hour under this rucksack and we looked at him going and we thought my god is this going to be fun the rest of this so, so, so the Americans then, obviously, this is a big, big trip to them, isn't it? And, and I mean, I remember you saying uh, a few minutes ago that you, you did it in 15 days, which is considered doing it quite quickly, I understand. Yeah, I mean, some people were doing it in seven days, you know, really fast people with lightweight gear and everything. But the general, general time was 21 days, and they thought 15 days was a bit fast, really. And were we actually enjoying it the way we should be, going at that speed? In fact, we were, because we were carrying you know, quite a lot less and looking around more. And I think we were enjoying it more than the people with the very big packs. But it's a kind of tradition, I think. You know, the Americans, they think big. And they think big when it comes to putting stuff in the rucksack as well. Uh, there were certainly people who were carrying one and a half times as much as we were. And I think even on this, you know, this long final stretch through the wilderness, we were probably carrying 35 pounds each including the seven days of food and the bear canister and all that stuff. And the path itself is very good. It's very well engineered. It's engineered suitable for mules. Mules use it, for mules and ponies. So it's a very good smooth path, much smoother and firmer than anything that you'd find in the UK, except perhaps bits of the Pennine Way. So, And the gradients, it's well graded as well. It's all zigzagged. So the going itself wasn't actually all that tough. It's just you were in the mid middle of the wilderness four days walk from anywhere mm. so th let's actually refer back to the book then because the the um the john Muir trail uh, guide by alan castle i understand was was quite helpful for you in the, in the planning stage yes and the trail itself is easy enough to follow once you're there and there's some very good maps that you can get for it but it's very complicated sorting it all out beforehand all the logistics yeah especially when you're starting from outside the country you have to get a permit or they call it a permit because they don't speak english over there <laughs> And you have to do that by phone to a ranger station, which is in Yosemite Valley. So there's an eight hour time difference. And you have to do it on a particular day when they start issuing the permits. Um, then there's a lot. There's the whole business of sending your parcel ahead to the Muir Trail Ranch, which 
you know, you don't send it to the Muir Trail Ranch, you send it to somewhere quite close and they bring it in by mule and store it in a shed for you. You have to get all that sorted out. It has to be packed in a particular way. Then the travelling is also quite awkward. You have to you have to travel to the beginning via San Francisco and a couple of buses and a train. You have to travel out to Los Angeles from Lone Pine and there isn't actually any public transport at all. So there's a lot of quite complicated stuff to sort out as well as working out what gear you need because obviously you don't want to carry anything at all that's unnecessary. I was quite annoyed because... What The one thing I think that the book didn't tell me was that the mosquitoes stopped sometime around the beginning of September. We were actually just starting on the 4th of September, just after Labour Day, when everything gets a bit quieter there. And if I'd known, I would have phoned up the ranger station at Yosemite the day before I left and said, have the mosquitoes died yet? And they would have said yes. And then I could have left behind my mosquito-proof inner tent and saved myself eight or nine ounces. <laughs> So, you know, there is a lot to think about. And if you don't get it right, you end up carrying a lot of stuff that you don't need. OK, so, so the first question is that uh, I, I know various people would be interested in doing this trail because it's, it's mentioned as being a, a sort of a doable one uh, in the US as regards a time scale. But realistically, if it's, you know, the, the average experienced UK walker can do this in, in 15 days, shall we say, what do you have to allow also for the travelling to and from the start and finish points and, and jet lag and so on? What, what, what would you think would be a sensible amount of time to put to one side to consider to do this? Uh, three weeks, absolute minimum. Um, I mean, you want to come in slowly. It's worth spending a day in San Francisco. I mean, for me, it was worth spending a day in San Francisco because um, they lost my rucksack in Philadelphia. Oh, it doesn't help very much, does <laughs> well, it? Well, it was great, you know, that it could catch up with me. They brought it up from the airport to my hostel. But if I'd, if I'd had to get to Yosemite to pick up my permit, you have to pick up your permit on the, day, on the date that's on it, or the day before, and start walking on the date that's on it. And you know, this permit business, there's, there's five a day, did you say, issues? Something like that for the whole trail. You can also get permits for just going into the wilderness from a particular point. And presumably then they, they count you in and count you out? They is don't that, count that... you out, but you have, to go, you have to pick up your permit on the right day or you lose it. Oh. And you have to start walking the following morning. And if you haven't picked it up by 10 o'clock in the morning, they give it to someone else. And you've travelled all the way. Well, you have to go and do something else, I suppose. Gosh. So, okay. yeah, that, the planning is complicated. And anyway, it's worth spending a day in San Francisco. And also, you have to collect this food package, you see, that you have to send to the Muir Trail Ranch 10 days into the walk. And it has to be packed in a particular kind of plastic barrel. It's all in the book. Mm. But you can't buy food here and bring it in your luggage because that's illegal. So you need to spend at least a day beforehand doing all this supply stuff and packaging it all up and sending it off. We spent a day in the supermarket. Um, that actually, that was just supplying for the for the start of the walk, the first three days. Gosh, uh, I mean, no, yeah, we spent a, we spent the day looking around San Francisco as well. It's a great place, really mm. interesting. But actually, because my son already lived in the States, he'd already done the, the plastic barrel and sending it off to Muir Trail Ranch, which, I, I mean, you might want to spend two days in San Francisco, or perhaps one and a half days, and then half a day travelling into Yosemite. And what about the, 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 se the second package, or is this the package you're referring to, the one that where you've, you've got to prepare for seven days? Yeah, that's the one that you sent to this that's place, Muir right. Trail Ranch. Right. Okay. That's seven days if you're walking it in 15 days. If you're walking it at the normal three-week time, it's 11 days of food. Now, the bear canister, I understand, that you've also got to take by, by law as well, is actually not capable of containing seven days' worth of food. Um, well, this is, this is the great un, unsaid. You, the bear canister, you, you hire it at Yosemite as you arrive, and you have to post it back at the other end, which is another of these little hassles that you just have to get your brain around. And, um, yeah, it'll hold about three days of food if it's really sort of concentrated, dehydrated food. But when you have to do the seven days... There's a sort of dilemma, but you're not really supposed to talk about it because it's kind of, you're not allowed to leave food anywhere except in the bear canister. So either you get very, very hungry or you have to do something a little bit indiscreet. And what might that be if anybody ever well, were to could, consider it? You could use the old-fashioned method, very technical method of hanging the stuff in a tree, but you do have to hang it up right and it takes some time and it takes some knack and you have also have to have the right piece of rope and all that. You have to hang it 10 feet from the trunk of the tree and 15 feet up the tree. And if you hang it wrong, the bears will just go, come and get it and they'll laugh at you. And not only will you then have to trek out because you haven't got enough food to complete the trail, 
you will also be subjected to a stiff fine of several thousand dollars for Gosh. improper food storage and allowing the bears to have unhealthy food. So, so how do the bears get get to the food then? Presumably they've learned over the years to, to uh, methods of, of, of getting hold of these canisters. Well, they can't do anything with a canister, because right. to open the canister you need a ten-cent piece, and bears don't have pockets so they don't carry money. And they have actually learnt to ignore the canisters. They'll give it a swipe to see if you've closed it properly, and then they'll walk past it and they go on to the next guys who've hung their food in the tree. And then there are various ways they can do it. They can climb the tree and jump on the branch that you've hung it over, or they send their bear cub up the tree, and the bear cub climbs along the branch and knocks down the, your food package. Chris Townsend told me a nice story. I didn't actually see any bears at all, and I was quite happy about that. My son was very disappointed. But most people do see one or two on the way across. And Chris Townsend, who's walked all these long trails in America, told me that his most amusing bear sighting was at Cathedral Lake, which is a beautiful campsite on the second or third night, where he'd, a bear had gone past his camp and walked past his bear canister and carried on to the next camp. And five minutes later, he heard a lot of noise and he saw this bear running up the hill towards the trees with a big food bag in its mouth and two naked campers <laughs> running after it, <laughs> shouting. <laughs> but they lost their food. Yes, yes. <laughs> I've had a memory, I'm sure. Um, OK, so that's the, um, that, that, the sort of some of the practicalities. I presume most of the practicalities. What about... Um, yeah, we, we haven't dealt with getting away at the end yes, of it. Yeah, which, yes, which, yeah. There isn't actually any... Pub there is public transport out of Lone Pine where you finish the walk, but it's very difficult to track down and it changes from year to year. Um, since the, the guidebook was written, they stopped the Greyhound bus, but at the moment, or last year anyway, the year that's just finished, there was a bus out on Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays. You want to spend a day in Lone Pine eating because it's a western town and they just have this ideal healthy diet for somebody who's been walking 15 days on the John Muir Trail. They're just big, lots of carbohydrate and enough nice salads and stuff to make you feel you're getting some vitamins as well. It, it, you know, absolutely what you shouldn't eat if you're working in an office before a computer, but ideal diet for somebody who's been walking 15 days across America. Yeah, yeah. And you have the, the killer cowboy breakfast is particularly good, and you want to stay in Lone Pine long enough to have about three of these. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why, you know, it takes longer than the walking, yeah. quite a lot longer than the walking time, but America's an interesting country, and... And obviously, a lot of these things are covered in the book, um, as you as you mentioned. The uh, you went um, sort of early September there. Now, what about uh, sort of that's the other thing that most British people would be considering straight away would be gear. You know, what is applicable over there that we've got? Um, uh, you know, th their seasons and their equipment that sh that we should take with us to to cope with um, that terrain and so on. Are we talking sort of normal three-season equipment, nothing particularly special from, from our point of view? We don't need to go and spend money for the sake of it? I wouldn't think you might want to spend money to get lighter stuff. Um, for instance, I didn't want to take my British waterproofs because they're heavy and they're meant to deal with rain. We had 20 minutes rain on the whole crossing. So I just went and bought the cheapest and lightest waterproofs I could get, you know, the sort of little plastic things that fit into a bag, which was useful for extra warmth at night, but in fact we didn't use it for rain at all. Mm -hmm. And at night time you say it was uh, getting down to freezing, presumably? Yes, we were doing it in September, which is a little bit eccentric. Um, I mean, I think Alan's guidebook says that September's too late in the season, that the risk in September is that the first big snowfall will arrive unexpectedly early. And in fact it did. There was a hurricane which sort of swung back in, and just as we were leaving the mountains, the first snowflakes were falling. In fact, it was the snow, big snow was forecast for the day we were going to cross Mount Whitney, which is the highest point of the trail and the highest point of America outside Alaska. So, but we, you know, we got lots of warning of this coming. Seven days ahead, we got the forecast. So we just speeded up for the last two days and went over Mount Whitney a bit earlier than we'd meant to. And as we were walking down it the following morning, the first flakes of snow fell. And the next day there was six inches of snow and two days later there was two or three feet of snow. So that's the problem with doing it in September, that you might get this snowfall. On the other hand, you don't get mosquitoes. It's easier to get the permit. The whole place is quieter. The daytime temperatures are very pleasant. Shorts weather, um, or towards the end of the trip we were wearing long trousers, but very nice temperature for walking between warm and cool. Uh, the disadvantages were that it was frosty at night and the day length was beginning to 
draw in. It was getting dark at about eight o'clock, which wasn't that wasn't too serious a disadvantage. And how did you compare to the to the Americans that were were that you, you met on the trail that were that were doing it? Were you considered eccentric, lightweight uh, English people, or yes? <laughs> well, no, Scottish <laughs> people. <laughs> Scottish. We're from <laughs> Scotland. Nice to have some yeah, reputation. We were, we were given the trail slightly embarrassing trail name of the Flying Scotsman, <laughs> which I really think you know, fifteen miles a day and maybe three thousand, four thousand feet of ascent. That is not flying. Yeah. <laughs> And most of the time, apart from this long stretch at the end, most of the time you're only carrying two or three days food. So you get, you know, the whole first week, ten days, to get used to the rucksack and you're gradually getting higher each day because each pass is higher than the one before. So you're acclimatising as well. One thing I would say about the trail, about half of it is in this forest and the forest is wonderful and it has amazing pine trees and John Muir rabbits on about it at immense length. And I sort of hadn't realised that this was so special. And I was just thinking, you know, it's like the forest in the Cairngorms or somewhere. You walk through it and get onto the mountains. So I was a little... I hadn't, wasn't appreciating the forest enough. But what we did do was every couple of days, especially at the beginning when we weren't carrying so much weight, we would drop the rucksacks on one of the passes and go up one of the little granite mountains alongside. That would only be a 1,000 feet, 1,500 feet of climb. But it would get us higher up into a different sort of country again and we get the enormous views and we get off this well-made mule track onto some wild country and we get the big rucksack off and that i really did think that added an extra dimension to the walk so i would definitely suggest anybody should take time to take in a few little side peaks along the way so at 15 miles a day then and and obviously you're doing these side excursions as well you weren't approaching it as being a super fast trip i mean in your own mind you would you would had decided it was going to take you 15 days and you're going to enjoy it Yes, I mean, the guidebook gives you 21 days, and I thought that's absurd. But I think I was misled a bit by the sort of, you know, they say 21 days, very, very tough trail. I thought, well, I can't really take 21 days for 210 miles. They would do it in 15, and it was very pleasant doing it at that speed. You know, when when people, you, you, you get um, demoralised by these people. They say it's an awful long way, and you can look at the map and it's not, but you believe the people rather than the map. It's... It's stupid. That's a very nice speed to do it, 15 miles a day, because the pack is not unbearable. You can look around and enjoy yourself. You can set up camp early enough to have a nice meal and a swim in the lake and go and visit the other people who are camping sort of the other end of the lake. And even do some fishing if you're into fishing. A lot of them do the fishing. And I presume with the, the permits issues, it means actually that when you do stop and camp, that there is only a handful of people around you. You're never going to be inundated with people because there's not that many people allowed on the trail on that day. It varies, and I think we were after Labor Day, which is the end of the season from the Americans' point of view. There's a lot of people on straight wilderness permits rather than a John Muir Trail permit. So in some places, there'll be quite a lot of people around. I mean, not like the Lake District, but like, say, the Cairngorms. Mm. And, and otherwise, you know, most nights there was somebody... There was only one night we had when we were all on our own. Most nights there were two or three other groups somewhere around the lake that we were camped around within walking distance to go and chat to them. And I like that. You know, I got on very well with these Americans. They're nice people. Um, they weren't typical Americans, I must say. None of them showed us their guns. They all <laughs> apologised for President Bush. You know, 30% of the Americans voted for the man, but none of them were on the trail. They were all very embarrassed about him. Um, so that was actually one of the benefits of the trail, from my point of view, was the company. I really enjoyed it. It was, and you know, we made sure we we had our supper early enough so we could go and chat with whoever else was around the lake because they were all such nice people yeah, yeah. no the the i think i believe I believe it's the first half goes through what they call um adam um, ansel adams uh, country the yeah, photography yeah. was it is there is it is it noted anywhere is there a big sign saying you're now entering the yeah. landscape photography um no there's there's small signs the signs are all quite discreet you start off in yosemite national park and yosemite is just amazing it blows your mind you, if you've got any sense, it's in the guidebook. You do the half dome, which is... Uh, if you imagine a, a chap with a bald head buried in the ground so that only his chin upwards is showing, and then reinterpret that in granite 4,000 feet high, that's half dome, except that half of it's missing. It's been chopped off by a glacier. And that side, there are these horrendous rock climbs that take two or three days. But the smooth side, which is about 45 degrees bare rock and because the granite does this geological thing called exfoliating there's a little step 18 inches high every now and then but they fixed it up with two chains and little wooden steps every four or five meters 
So it's it's pretty hair raising, but it's it's pretty safe. It's also very busy, so that it's good to be backpacking and it's good to be after Labor Day because getting round somebody else on this thing is a little bit dodgy, especially if they're scared. <laughs> um, but it, oh, it's amazing. It's not like I mean, you think the, the Cairngorms has a lot of granite, but Yosemite has hardly anything else. There's a sort of shelf with a few pine trees struggling, and then down in the valley, there's a sort of sea of pine trees. But it's mostly just bare rock at various different angles. It's an astonishing place. So you do that one on the first or the second day. We did it on the afternoon of the first day. What was I talking about? I talked about side peaks. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, yes, Yosemite. Yeah, and then you get into the Ansel Adams Wilderness. It is all granite, nearly all granite, and the Ansel Adams Wilderness has beautiful lakes covered in islands and some very shapely peaks, sort of standing at the end of the lake. So you can have your supper at one end of the lake, and you look along the lake to this beautiful mountain at the other end of the lake. And then it's even better when you're having your breakfast because the sun goes up and it all goes pink. Oh, beautiful. Um, we we tempted to uh, did it inspire to take a, f- a fishing rod next time or take a fishing line? No, because it just it's just so slow, and they were all complaining that there weren't any fish. I suppose fishermen do that all the time. I didn't need a reason for standing still. If I wanted to stand still, you know, I would just stand still to take photographs, mm. lie in the grass, look at the mountains and the sky. The trouble is that you can't be absolutely sure. Yeah, we did meet one party of three guys with fishing rods, and they were going quite slowly so they'd get time for the fishing. But they'd cleverly taken just enough food so that they were going to survive but be pretty hungry. And if they actually wanted to have enough food to be nice, they were going to have to catch it for themselves. Right. I thought that was good. I thought that was a sporting way of going about it. But, but you didn't see them later on, presumably. Well, no, they were moving slower than us, and they, were, they weren't on the trail. They were doing a a sort of four or five day walk right. three guys just taking a, a week out away from the office together mm. so so the, the obviously the, the, the book the book going back to the book the book was obviously a great help to you in in sort of ironing out all these kinks and obviously it was a great advantage having your son living over there as well to to sort some things out it was an advantage but you can't i mean he packed he didn't know the country at all he lives on the east coast and this is on the west coast it's a six hour plane ride it was completely unfamiliar to him as it was to me it just it did make it more convenient putting the stuff in the plastic barrel and sending it off. He could do it from New York, and we didn't have to worry about that when we were in San Francisco. Otherwise, it didn't make very much difference. Uh, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> what, what would you... Oh, the logistics of it. The book, the, yeah, the book, the book is great. I actually met uh, two separate American parties on the trail who were using this British published book because they thought that it was so clear. It was the clearest and... And because it had all the, it's geared to a British audience, so it tells you in detail all this logistical stuff. Whereas a book that's aimed at Californians kind of assumes you've been in the, in the Sierra before, which isn't actually what you want in a guidebook. You wanted to assume you don't know anything, and mm. that's what this one does because mm. it assumes you're British. So, so looking looking back on the trip, with with, with which you've obviously got great, uh, very fond memories. What um, is there any way that you would you would consider a, a way you could have improved the trip for yourself? Is there anything that you would have changed, whether it, apart from leaving your inner tent uh, behind? Is there anything else you could have done to have made it easier or more enjoyable? Yeah, I would have taken in more side peaks than I did. We did some diversion. We took in five. Yeah, the, the guidebook says that you should do half dome although it's not on the trail at the beginning and the end you cross mount whitney which is i mean the trail finishes on the summit of mount whitney good for it <laughs> um and we took in i think four or five other diversions and type side peaks on the way and I, I wish we'd done more of that that was that's that's the only thing that i think we could have improved on otherwise it was just a great trip and as regards uh, people thinking of uh, uh, doing it, obviously uh, uh, putting aside three weeks it makes sense. Um, level of fitness, as regards an average hill more, could you reckon? No problem. N- yeah, no, you need to be you need to be used to the rucksack because you're starting. If you need to be, you know, when you're backpacking. If you go straight from day walks in the mountains to backpacking, you get very very sore shoulders, and you think a fifteen mile, four thousand feet of ascent day walk, you can do that fine. But doing that with a pack on is a bit different, and you do need to spend some time, not very much time. I reckon, you know, a couple of two-day walks with a biggish rucksack, with, you know, say, say you're going to be carrying 25 pounds for the beginning of the trail, and your normal day pack's 15 pounds, then I just think a couple of days 
walking with 20 pounds, 22 pounds, enough so that you can feel the extra weight, but not enough so that you're suffering, an intermediate step, and it strengthens the shoulders and all. I mean, this is standard for any backpacking trip, to get used to the extra weight of the rucksack. Mm. So you do need that extra fitness. Um, otherwise, it's hard for me to say, because, you know, I'm quite fit. Um, and there were people on the trail who were suffering. On the other hand, there were people on the trail who were also quite fit, not specialised walkers at all, but, you know, the right weight and fit and keen, who were having a great time and enjoying themselves. You what, don't have to be super fit at all. What, what um, uh, size rucksack did you take, then? Um, I take quite a big one. I think it was 65 litres. But uh, the bare barrel takes up a bit of... You know, it's oh, a nuisance. Of course, yes. It, it takes up a lot of space. Um, yeah, so that's how big I was taking. It wasn't it wasn't jammed full. I don't like to have the rucksack jammed full. And is it, is it a, a trail that you could do quite easily with trail shoes rather than boots? I was wearing lightweight boots, but, yeah, there were two young women who were keeping pace with us all the way in their 20s. They were doing it with trail shoes. They no, didn't? No problems? Well, one of them had very sore feet. <laughs> <laughs> but then so did some of the guys in boots. It does seem so wonderful for me, having dry feet the whole way. Mm. Um, my feet were sort of singing <laughs> the whole way along. Well, the, the one thing that struck me from from uh, the Americans I've spoken to that have come to the to the UK to do um, to do various walks is just how much navigation is involved and how how much it is it dawns upon them usually within the first twenty four hours that we take our map reading quite seriously. Um, from what you're saying, it would strike me that people would actually find following the trail very, very easy if they're used to just normal hill walking and basic navigation. Oh, yes. Any UK hill walker who, who does his own map reading would find this trail very easy. Mm, excellent. So are you planning to uh, to go back and, uh, and sort of do anything else again on the same trail? Not on the same trail, no. But, you know, it depends how long my son's out there because it's an expensive, blooming place to get to. And I like Europe. I'm very fond of Europe. It's a wonderful trail. It's as good as the trails in Europe. It is different. It's, you know, the going is easier. The country is wilder. It's a different sort of trail from what I'm used to doing in Europe. But in my book, it's, it's as good as the good stuff in Europe. And it's twice as far away. Um, and it costs one and a half times as much. That's not to say, you know, don't go. Especially if you like the idea of real wilderness, but a nice easy path and a nice easy trail. And you don't mind the big rucksack and you're not that scared of the bears. So it's, it, it's one of the great trails of the world. I, you know, I've enjoyed it as much as anything I've done. It's just that I'm keen on Europe. I love Europe. The John Muir Trail is certainly one on my to-do list and having poured over the book by Alan and now picked Ronald's brain, I feel more confident that it would make for an excellent two to three weeks hike. The book also has loads of information on the flora and fauna of the area, the wildlife and of course all accommodation options. Certainly it's one I found myself picking up on a regular basis. So that's the John Muir Trail by Alan Castle, which is available direct from the Cicerone website and all good outdoor book retailers. This sponsored programme is produced and hosted by theoutdoorstation.co.uk.